Hello and welcome. You're watching Coronavirus Facts versus Myths. I'm Gargi Rawat, our top story. Now let's get you the data first. In India recorded under 50,000 new COVID cases in 91 days with 42,640 new cases being reported. The death count climbed to 3,89,302 with 1,167 fresh fatalities. The record low cases were reported on a day when India vaccinated a record 86.16 lakh people. The daily positivity rate has further dropped to 2.56%. But now a look at the Delta variant seen as responsible for India's second wave. A worrying spike of coronavirus infections in Europe is being driven by the Delta variant, according to global health leaders. Even as immunization rates in some countries are on the way up, the Delta variant, which was first detected in India, has now started worrying U.S. authorities as well. And to talk more about this, we're joined by Do Dr. Eric Fiegelding, epidemiologist and health economist from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, uh, doctor, for joining us uh, again on the show. First and foremost, what do we know about the spread of the Delta variant in the United States? Yeah, the Delta variant has uh, progressed a lot. Obviously, from India to many corners of the world, the UK is now at 99%. Portugal is also above 96%. US, last week, everyone estimated around 10%. This week, it's about 31%, according to the latest. It has tripled in one week. Now, that is very alarming. We know the Delta variant spreads very quickly. And we know that there's parts of America that is not vaccinated enough. There are corners of America that's more vaccinated than the UK and Israel, but there's corners of America that's much, much less. And we're now seeing the Delta variant really being a scourge on the whole world. And it's incredibly infectious, as we've seen in also Australia, where even fleeting contact, fleeting contact mere seconds has led to several uh, uh, infections and a, a mini outbreak there. So it is very dangerous. In fact, I wanted to talk more about that, uh, about those cases in Australia where a man is said to have spread the Delta variant to others and that one of the people who contracted the infection had just brushed past this person. Yeah, absolutely. It's very worrying uh, because it was actually not just one, but two different cases of fleeting contact, just merely brushing past each other. Um, and both led to the infection of the other person. Uh, there, one of them was even recorded on a security camera that the man and the woman never uh, had any contact. They just walked past each other, and that was the extent of their entire exposure to each other. And so I think this really, really hits the nail on the head that the Delta variant is not like any variant. It is truly, truly one of the fastest, more, most contagious. WHO's recent analysis says it is two times more contagious than the old strain. And that is way more than even the alpha variant, the B117, or the P1 from Brazil. It is leaps and bounds more contagious. And clearly, the evidence from New South Wales, Australia shows us why. And in Israel as well, there have been clusters reported in schools, outbreaks in schools. And this is very concerning considering that they have very high levels of vaccination. Yeah, Israel, uh, the adult population is heavily vaccinated. It's the most heavily vaccinated. And it's Pfizer two-dose vaccinated for the most part. Um, but of course, children are not vaccinated yet. And teenagers 12 or above have just only recently started getting vaccines in Israel. So hence, we're seeing a lot of children's cases of the Delta variant in Israel. And clearly, uh, the high levels of vaccination wasn't enough to slow the spread. And we're also seeing breakthrough cases in, among adults, among teachers in these schools. So I think clearly we need to learn that when we have a more contagious variant. Uh, one dose is not enough. The Delta variant clearly says one dose is not enough. Even Dr. Fauci says it. All the global experts say it. And you really need to go for two doses. And also remember, if a uh, virus's R has transmissibility has doubled, you double the R zero from originally three to four to now six to eight. And I think that's really in the range of where the uh, Delta variant is, because if you double transmissibility and you increase the R0, that means that the herd immunity threshold for fully vaccinated 
also increases. 70% is no longer the threshold. It needs to be in the upper 80s to 90%. And that is the reality. And that's including children. So the total population. And I think that means that we're really, really far away from truly containing it so that we don't need to wear masks or do any distancing. Because we want to avoid lockdowns, of course. We also want to long-term uh, go back to normal without masks and distancing. But the Delta variant is currently our greatest challenge against that. And so we have to be very vigilant that this pandemic is not over yet. Right, uh, absolutely. And we're discussing, you know, the Delta variant in other parts uh, of the world. But here in India, we now have a variant which we're describing as Delta Plus. And uh, so far, uh, we, we're, say, we're categorizing it as a variant of interest, but not a variant of concern. So your view on that? Yeah, this Delta Plus is interesting. You know, there's some it has some unique mutations that makes it potentially worrisome. But we really need to see any actual data on not just neutralization against the vaccine in the lab tests, but also how does it handle in real world efficacy against the vaccine. That takes time. Whether or not it is more severe, more contagious, that takes time. And in certain ways, you know, UK is tracking it. It's, it's Delta Plus is in UK's weekly reports now, but it, it, there's not enough cases to definitively say for sure. But what we do know is that Delta variant um, proper itself is twice as contagious. It is two and a half times greater risk of hospitalization than the alpha, which together means it's four times greater hot risk of hospitalization than the original, because the alpha is also a uh, greater risk of hospitalization. And, you know, with the one dose of vaccine attenuation down to 30%, that is just not enough protection. And so we really, really mitigate a lot. And most countries in the world are not even close to even half of their population fully vaccinated. And even when you are, look at Israel. Clearly, the uh, Delta variant is contagious enough to keep spreading, even with two-thirds of the population vaccinated. In fact, that brings me this, to the subject of vaccination. The rates are so slow, you know, given how it is uh, slow in a majority of the world. The fear is that we're going to see the pandemic being stretched out longer. In fact, many have also criticized that steps announced so far by the U.S. and by the G7 as not being enough. Yeah, I think the G7's uh, commitment for half a billion doses in the U.S. and one billion doses total and, and, and they're not all coming immediately. They're coming over the coming months and quarters. It is not enough by leaps and bounds. We need, honestly, we're probably two, three billion more doses, especially when we go with the two-dose uh, vaccination strategy. And I think the problem is the virus is spreading just so quickly that it's getting more warm bodies to mutate. And eventually, there will be something even more contagious, even more vaccine evasive than even the Delta variant. And that's why I worry about. And I think a lot of rich countries, they seem fine for now, but look at UK, one of the most highly vaccinated countries. Cases and hospitalizations are surging. Look at Israel, one of the most highly vaccinated cases are surging. And I think the rich countries need to get out of their mindset that uh, the vaccine is gonna solve everything immediately and they don't have to worry about the rest of the world. Because I think a lot of people in the West think the pandemic's over, let's get back to normal, lift everything, go on cruises, not worry about these kind of issues because it's a virus of the developing world. And I think that it's just incredibly callous, heartless, and nearsighted and short-sighted on actually ending the pandemic and ending uh, this uh, purgatory that we live in. Well, that's one way to describe it. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric, for joining us on the program. Now, the other focus on the show today, a recent preliminary study in the UK has found that COVID-19, even if mild or moderate, is possibly leaving people with significant impact on their brains. The study involved pre- and post-infection brain scans involving close to 800 people. Now, the scans showed loss of grey matter indicative of damage and the areas affected involving functions relating to smell and taste, cognition and memory formation. Most of the patients examined had mild to moderate disease, while 
it has not been peer reviewed yet. The study has been printed, but it's not been peer reviewed. It's still very uh, concerning to know about, uh, you know, uh, the impact that COVID is having on the brain, since we already know that one of the uh, known uh, post-COVID symptoms is something that we describe as brain fog. Well, let's uh, go across now to Dr. Uh, Sonia Lal Gupta, Director Metro Group of Hospitals and Neurologists, for more on this. And Dr. while this is, uh, you know, one such study that has and it's not been peer reviewed yet still it is very concerning because we do know that a lot of patients are complaining of brain fog post covid are some even concerned about their memory absolutely uh, gargi you know and the biggest concern about the study is that this is actually one of the first type of study which they've actually looked at people before the infection and then after the infection so approximately out of the 800 people they looked at approximately uh, around 400 actually got the virus and then, so then they did the scans again to look at it post the infection what the brain showed and as you mentioned what they found was that even in mild to moderate cases so people who were not hospitalized you know previously studies have looked at people who were hospitalized so in this study they looked at people who were not hospitalized and what they found was that there was loss of gray matter so gray matter is a type of you know their type so our brain is white matter and gray matter gray matter basically processes the information so particularly in those parts of the brain that were related with taste and smell more so they saw that the cells had shrunk in size also areas related with memory as well as with emotions so they did find that but more so it was focused on finding it in these areas of taste and smell and what came about this was that maybe over time we can compensate for those changes that are happening but the shrinkage still might last forever so that is where the concern is how long because once the brain is damaged as we know you know we do not have currently anything that can help the brain regenerate whatever the brain regenerates it does by itself very slowly and steadily over time so there isn't really a medication or a magic potion to actually regenerate it so i think this is kind of raising alarm bells yes it's a very small study but at the same time i think what people have to understand and exactly just before you even this dr eric ding what he was telling about how yes. now contagious you know uh, the delta variant is becoming uh, people have to understand they have to take precautions and they have to get vaccinated uh, because that's the only way it's not only about those 14 days of infection it's the long term effect of covid that is also really concerning especially in the younger people we do not know how much it will affect their memory in terms of years to come and right. you know also emotions irritability and everything else right and and we need more such studies to tell us but doctor this is not the only disease that has affected the brain isn't it there there have been uh, you know there are still other infections that also affect the brain so just to absolutely. you know tell our viewers about that yeah No, no absolutely so there are a lot of viral infections you know we've had the zika virus we know for a fact that you know affects the brain that was causing you know in in babies who were not born yet you know shrink you know small size brains then we have of course the herpes virus we know for a fact that that actually causes something called herpes encephalitis where there's swelling over the brain so there are a lot of infections actually related with viruses that do affect the brain so i do not want like people should get scared oh my god you know i have these symptoms now what's going to happen to me the good part is most of the symptoms are mild yes they might be a little long term but they are mild so with other infections actually the symptoms are more severe in this we're not seeing it actively when people are having the covid infection that they're having a lot of neurological symptoms but it is more so after the infection is gone we are seeing some subtle changes so it's it's more about the quality of life that will get affected more so than you know in it causing any long term effects so far for what we have in the data so i think it's people shouldn't get super scared also but they should only understand that they have to just take precautions and avoid getting the infection i think now that india is opening up again we all are scared about the third right. wave coming forward and what's going to happen so i think just just a message again you know uh, for people to just please take precautions wear double mask wash your hands social distancing and Absolutely. you know and vaccine 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 Let's absolutely do just get vaccinated to protect yourself because you don't know the long term impacts of this disease thank you so much dr sonia for joining us on the show sure. today absolutely sure my pleasure well with that time for us to slip into a short break on the other side your questions on vaccines and covid and we'll have dr neha gupta joining us to take all those questions
Now for our special campaign, Vaccinate India in partnership with Google, where we discuss questions that many of you have about vaccines, about coronavirus. And these are questions that you often look up online and Google. And to answer those questions for you, we're joined by Dr. Neha Gupta, Consultant Infectious Disease Specialist, Fortis Memorial Research Institute. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for joining us. And, you know, one of the questions that even uh, so many months after the vaccination drive has started in India in January, even so people still look up whether COVID vaccines are safe they often ask online are covid vaccines safe so what would your answer be to that absolutely i think uh, one must vaccinate they are very safe and even now there are a lot of patients who say that can i take the vaccine young individuals ask for it but they are absolutely safe there may be some mild side effects like there may be some fever but that can be taken care of with simple uh, dolo yafikrosin all these you know, just simple uh, side effects are there and there may be some soreness on the hand. That's about it. Otherwise, they are very, most of the time, they are safe. Right, doctor, unfortunately, people, you know, they, they look, look up a lot online. They follow podcasts or YouTube videos. And unfortunately, there are a lot of anti-vaxxers online. And that's as far as, you know, if we talk about uh, populations in uh, the urban populations uh, go. And then, of course, you have rural India where there are all sorts of other concerns and all sorts of other misconceptions when it comes to vaccines. Absolutely. I think in the rural area, what you said is absolutely right. There is a hesitancy for the vaccination. And that is why uh, it's really important for us to create awareness uh, regarding the same. And more and more camps are being done. A lot of NGOs are coming up and vaccinating uh, the rural areas as well. So I think this should be... Um, this should take care in the coming Yeah, future. so there's a need yes. to create a lot more awareness around the vaccine drive, especially now that we're going big with the vaccine drive. Yesterday, we managed to vaccinate 86 lakh people across the country, which is absolutely amazing. But we have to vaccinate more and more people, and that's only going to happen if we manage to penetrate uh, the rural parts of the country and if we have enough awareness, enough counselling around the vaccinations, isn't it? Absolutely. It's awareness, which is very, very much needed. And even among the urban area, the population, for example, the low social, socioeconomic status, they also need to be uh, made aware regarding the efficacy and the need for vaccination. Right. Another question, and I know you've answered a bit of this already, but are there any side effects to the vaccines? That's another question that people often look up. So, most common side effect is mild fever and some people may get high fever for a day or two but it's usually subsides back and uh, otherwise there may be soreness at the site of vaccination and this all this can be taken care of it may be just for a day or two and can can actually be easily handled with just a paracetamol and again vaccine does not really induce or uh, result in uh, infections all right, uh, Dr. Neha. All right, well, Dr. Neha, they're answering the questions uh, that uh, people often have uh, on, and, and ask online and some of the questions that they continue to ask even months later is about uh, the safety and side effects. Uh, Dr. Neha, back with us. Is also, uh, is there any special sort of care people with, you know, certain conditions need to take when they go for their vaccines, if they're, I don't know, diabetic, have some cardiac issues? Also, if, they're, uh, if they have allergies, uh, do they have to, if you could tell us, uh, you know, what care needs to be taken? Absolutely. So the only contraindication is if there is anaphylaxis to any kind of drug. It's not just allergy. Allergy can be different type of allergies. It can be simple mild allergy like maybe some rashes, but that's not a contraindication. If there is a severe allergy, anaphylactic reaction, which is requiring to any drug, which is making uh, where there is a need for oxygen requirement, difficulty in breathing, only this is a contraindication for the vaccination. Otherwise, even uh, patients with diabetes, hypertension, patients who are on blood thinners, they, patients with HIV, immunocompromised patients, transplant recipients, all these patients can go ahead with the vaccination. All right. In fact, they are the ones who are most vulnerable and should go ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neha Gupta, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Gargi. Thank you so much. Thank you.